Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Augusto Villanueva Rodriguez. He's an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and he works on liver-related issues, diseases. Uh, he's a hematologist, and he also deals with oncology, you know, liver cancer type issues. So, Augusto, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, what, what's your, um, you know, like in, in a bit more detail, what's your research about? What's your work about? Yeah, so I, I work in different aspects related to to liver cancer, and and I would say the general scope of my work is trying to incorporate uh, molecular information from the tumor in tools that can be applied in the clinical setting to improve prognosis prediction, uh, prediction of response to different therapies, or most recently, I've been very interested in trying to develop novel methods for early detection of liver cancer. With uh, liver cancer, what, who does it strike? You know, is it older people? Is it people that you know, drink a lot of alcohol, like what, are, what seems to be the precursors of it? So the, it, it's extremely rare to develop liver cancer if you have a healthy liver. It's very rare. So most of the patients with liver cancer has um, underlying liver disease, mostly cirrhosis, and the cause of this can be either viral hepatitis, hepatitis B or hepatitis C, alcohol use disorder, or more recently, a, a cause of um, liver disease and also liver cancer that has emerged and has increased in the last 10 to 15 years. It's what is called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And that's essentially the abnormal deposit of fat in the liver that induces chronic inflammation and a set of changes that predisposes that patient to, to develop liver cancer. Now, uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis is relatively frequent but the number of these patients that end up developing liver cancer is very rare. So the challenge is, can we identify those patients that are at higher risk of developing tumors that we can enroll in what is called surveillance programs? So in surveillance programs, what we're trying to do is follow these patients closely so we can detect the tumors when they're very small and they're potentially curable. So worldwide, when you look at the numbers of liver cancer patients, you see there's a lot of liver cancer where there is a lot of liver diseases. For instance, Asia and mostly China and Sub-Saharan Africa, the number of, pay, of people with chronic hepatitis B infection is very high. And that's why there's a lot of liver cancer in these areas. In Western countries and the US, the main causes of liver cancer were mostly hepatitis C, but that has changed because now there are very effective treatments to cure hepatitis C. And now is when I, what I mentioned before about no alcoholic steatohepatitis is emerging as one of the major causes of liver cancer in Western populations. So at what point does hepatitis uh, turn into liver cancer? Is it, you know, does the person have to have it for years or like, again, how does it happen? Yeah, so the natural history of liver cancer, it takes um, a lot of years. So on average, from the time that you get the infection with viral hepatitis, either B or C, until the time that you get liver cancer can span 30 to 40 years. So during that time is when you have chronic inflammation and fibrosis that is the microenvironment, the milieu that favors, and, and we don't know, and we don't entirely understand which are the dominant molecular alterations that happens during these years that end up favoring the development of liver cancer. But this is a very large, very long, time span since you get the initial damage to the liver until you get liver cancer. And that's precisely the, the rationale for implementing early detection programs. So for instance, in patients that have chronic, uh, they have cirrhosis due to hepatitis B or hepatitis C, these patients are recommended to undergo surveillance. So every six months, they do an ultrasound of the abdomen and uh, some blood tests. And the objective of that is to detect the tumors when they're very small, because we know that they're at high risk 
of developing liver cancer. So when we detect the tumors when they are small, the, the possibility of curing these patients is very high. Now, one of the things that we're doing in the lab is trying to develop new tools to improve that process. So mm, the current gold standard for early detection of liver cancer is, as I told you, ultrasound and, and, and a blood test that analyzes a molecule called alpha fetoprotein. Now, the problem is that ultrasound is very operator dependent, depending on who does the ultrasound. The patient has to go to a tertiary center to do the ultrasound. Some patients live far away, and this has to be done every six months. So it's, it's, um, it's not very easy. And actually, the, there is a significant problem of implementation of this surveillance program. So people, despite they are at risk, they're not enrolling in these programs that can detect the tumors at early stages. So we're looking at a technology that is called liquid biopsy that essentially entails the analysis of tumor components that are released to the bloodstream. It could be either fragments of DNA from the tumor, or it could be um, vesicles released for tumor cells that can be isolated in the blood. And we do a number of analyses, mostly sequencing-based, that detects products that are specific to the tumors that can allow to identify or diagnose these tumors or detect them uh, when they're very small. Now, when, when you... Um... When you say products, are these like uh, extracellular vesicles that come from the tumor cells, or is it stuff that's just shed from the tumor, like you know, are the actual cells themselves? Yeah. So with the ex with the with the vesicles, the most of them are actively secreted by the tumor cells, and um, it has been shown in other tumors, for example, in pancreatic cancer, has been shown that these vesicles are critical to prime distant tissues for metastasis to develop. So the content of these vesicles are active, are functional. In, in the case of liver cancer, we, we still are pretty unsure. Uh, we're not sure that these may be functional, at least when we use them as early detection biomarkers. But certainly, there, we can detect products in these vesicles that are specific to patients with liver cancer. And the main advantage of this is that, as opposed to having the patients come into the hospital to make the ultrasound every six months, you can just collect the blood at the point of care, which is much more, much more convenient for the patient. You send the sample to a central lab, runs the analysis, and provides an estimation of risk. If you think about it, the, the paradigm for early detection, so what we do in terms of surveillance programs, hasn't changed significantly in the last 20 to 25 years. So there's a huge... You know, you know what would be... Uh... Really great is imagine you know how they have those um, continuous glucose monitors. Yes. If they had ones that were tuned for particular cancers, and someone had that, then they could always be monitoring, and then any upticks or changes, you know, could be reported right away. Right. Maybe you don't need like continuous monitoring because it doesn't make change if you detect the tumor today or tomorrow. But uh, certainly, if you have a device that you connect to your phone and you take a tiny you know, amount of blood and you can analyze or they take these analytes and you get a report instantaneously it would be extremely useful. It will facilitate things to, to, to detect tumors when they're curable, right? That's true. Um, so right now for liver cancer in particular, is it, I mean, how is it, uh, you know, once someone has it or if uh, they're doing early surveillance, is the surveillance biopsies or is it blood, you know, you're going to a lab to be taken or how is it right now? Well, now, uh, what people do in, in terms of surveillance, they go and 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 get some um, ultrasound to get some imaging of of the liver, right? So they they look at the liver. There's any nodule there, and and if they if the nodule is detected, then that triggers additional um, confirmatory diagnostic procedures. It can be a biopsy, it can be an MRI, it can be a CT scan, depending on the characteristics of the patients. But early detection is key because the prognosis of the patient is very different whether the, the tumor is diagnosed at early stages or at advanced stages. Um, so that's why it's so important to have these patients at risk that we know they are at high risk enrolling in these programs so we can increase the chances of the patients of being cured with mostly surgical resection or some of them may be benefit from transplant. So what's your focus right now? Is it the early detection or is it the particular pathways by which the tumor cells you know, show their hand and say, hey, they're there at an early point? We're working a lot on early detection. And uh, traditionally, this study has been difficult to conduct because what you want in an early detection tool is to, to diagnose or to detect tumors that are at early stages. So 
when you do the study, you need to enroll patients with a small tumors or relatively small tumors because that's a true challenge. So your marker has to work in patients who have a two centimeter liver cancer. So to collect, to enroll, or to have these patients in the studies is, is, is not easy, right? So that's why the main focus now is to expand on, a, we've been collecting blood from patients for, for almost four years now, and, and we have a decent amount of patients who fulfill that criteria. There's another thing that we're very interested in is that in the last four years, there has been dramatic changes in the management of patients with liver cancer in terms of systemic therapies. So until 2016, there was only one systemic drug that shows efficacy uh, to improve survival in patients with liver cancer. So that changed significantly again in the last four years, and now there are nine drugs that have been approved by the FDA because they're effective in treating patients with advanced disease. This is a different clinical setting. It's not early detection of these patients with advanced tumors, so much more disease, and the prognostic is, is worse. So one of the challenges that the community has now is, uh, so we have you know many different therapies. They were tested in parallel. So they were not tested one against the, the other because clinical trials, most of them run in parallel. So it's unclear which is the best way to sequence therapy. So what order the different treatments should be applied to the patients. And when, one way to approach that problem is by developing biomarkers of response. In other words, you have a patient, you do a test. In our case, we're looking at circulating tumor DNA. And based on the mutation that the patient has, the mutation profile that we can detect in the blood, we can estimate which is the best therapy or the, the, the therapy that provides the highest chances of that patient responding to that therapy. So once you do that, you can provide a organized, a structured way to allocate sequential therapies based on likelihood of response using specific characteristics of the tumor. In our case, again, is mutational analysis of circulating tumor DNA. So at what point are you able to catch the tumors? Can you, you know, do you express it in terms of the number of cells that constitute them, or there's only one tumor and not multiple, or there's no metastases? Like, how do you characterize when you've you know, caught them at what stage? Yeah, so with circulating tumor DNA, you get, you're able to detect tumors when they are as little as two centimeters in size. So uh, liver cancer in, with a size of two centimeters can potentially be cured. So we're talking about stages where they're very, uh, very early, very small, that you can certainly cure the patient. Um, now, the thing with multiple tumors and metastases is that, and, and that's another thing that we've, we've been working on is, so when you have a patient, you take a biopsy, for example, and you do mutation profiling and you analyze, you know, you detect that the patient has a mutation in P53 or a mutation in, in beta catenin or, or all the mutations that we know are prevalent in liver cancer. Now, the question that we had is, so uh, what happens if you make, if you do the biopsy in a different tumor nodule or in a metastasis or in a different area of that specific tumor nodule? In other words, how heterogeneous tumors are? So would you get the same information or they're so heterogeneous that depending on the way you do the biopsy, you get different molecular information. And what is critical about that is uh, there may be mutations or molecular alterations that predict response to a specific therapy. So if that alteration is present in one nodule and not in the, in the other nodule, it does matter where you do the biopsy. So uh, we, we try to address that uh, doing an analysis on intratumor heterogeneity, and we enrolled 14 patients, and we did multi-regional sampling of these resection specimens of these 14 patients with liver cancer, and we published it this year in Nature Communications. And what we found is that, you know, 20, 30 percent of the of the cases, there is significant intratumor heterogeneity. So in those cases, it does matter where you do the biopsy, not only in terms of the specific alterations that you detect for the tumor, but the actual immune infiltrate or the degree or the amount or the quality of the interactions between the tumor cells and the immune cells are different in the different areas of the primary tumor nodule. How do you characterize the difference in the immune response based on, uh, I mean, even within, within a given tumor or in the proximity of it? So, w for example, we have this patient that, um, so the patient has a fairly large tumor. We're talking about diameter, I think it was like six or seven centimeters. And we took five different, so we sampled five different regions of that six centimeter uh, tumor. Now in one region, when you do this histologically or when you do TCR sequencing or RNA-seq, 
which is a significant amount of immune cells, T cells, heavily infiltrated region. Now in a different region of the same tumor nodule of the same patient is barely uh, infiltrated with immune cells. Now, if you think about uh, deriving biomarkers of response to immune therapies, if, and this is not the case, but in the case that, you know, specific TCR sequences or TCR clonality will define, will predict response to immune-based therapies. In this patient in particular, it would be, will make a huge difference if you do a biopsy in that region that is heavily infiltrated as opposed to the other region that is barely infiltrated. Now, this is not very common. It doesn't happen much. But in around 20, 30% of the patients, you can find these huge discrepancies of the amount of immune infiltrate that you have in the same tumor nodule. And this this can happen in what like a two centimeter size tumor. Uh, it can happen, but it's not as frequent as with larger tumors. So the degree of intersomal heterogeneity scales up with the with tumor size. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. Um, have you been able to look at, at, at well? Has anyone looked three D at various tumors and seen the heterogeneity spatially? Does that tell you anything? And as the heterogeneity you know, grows as the tumor grows, is there a certain point where now all right, a metastasis will start to form, you know, distally? Um, is there any, can you look at the heterogeneity and say, all right, it's getting ready to metastasize? Well, um, in, in liver cancer, there are not that many studies because with humans, it's very difficult to get those 3D uh, information of, of, of tumors, but certainly, and, and this is our impression, when, when you look at intertumor heterogeneity, not only to what I talk about, you know, whether you do the biopsy, you can get different results, but if you look at it as a proxy of cancer evolution, certainly the tumors that are more heterogeneous, the possibility of a clone, a cancer, uh, a clone of cancer cells emerging and being more aggressive and hence more prone to disseminate and for metastasis is higher. So again, I don't think there's compelling data on that. And, uh, but based on, on, on our study, that we can say that the amount of um, intertumor heterogeneity scales with the likelihood of a tumor being more aggressive. Okay, makes sense. So w what's the next step in your analysis? Like, what, what are you trying to figure out? Again, you want to make a blood test where people can, d can tell whether, uh, you know, they have this tumor or like what's the next step for you or you know what are you trying to evaluate right so we have a pilot study where we derive this um, marker for early detection of liver cancer on so we started with 200 patients and now we're trying to expand to have a decent cohort of 1,000 patients so with that the level of validation is significantly higher and our confidence to you know pursue market development and uh, you know, develop a more deployable test for clinical practice, it would be higher. So we're trying to expand and, and, and further validate our marker in, in different cohorts. Again, it's, it's always nice when you have, you know, patients from different centers and, and, and let's say you put the test, your marker to the test and make sure that it works despite you, you test it in different scenarios. So that's one thing that we're, we're very interested. The second thing is with the intertumor heterogeneity story is that I told you that we did a study in 14 patients. We have expanded and we have now around 80 patients with multi-regional sampling. And we're going to see if we can, again, uh, estimate the degree of intertumor heterogeneity and how that correlates with aggressiveness and more importantly with response to systemic therapies. And that's another thing that we're still working on. And the, and the final thing that we're very interested in is connecting both worlds. So can we use the information from the liquid biopsy, the mutation profiling, or the exosomal, so the vesicles that are released by the tumors, to quantify or estimate the degree of intratumor heterogeneity? Because you think about it, uh, to, um, you know, to, to biopsy the same tumor in different areas in clinical practice is not feasible. We did it because we use resection specimens, so the tumor is out of the patient. We can, you know, it's easy to take five regions of, of, of the tumor, but when you do a biopsy, it's not realistic to think about doing five biopsies in the same patient. So we need tools to estimate easily intertumor heterogeneity without the need of doing multiple biopsies in the same patient. So it's kind of, those are kind of the three things that we're working on at the, at the moment. What, what does it mean for a tumor to be heterogeneous? You know, heterogeneous? It's just there's different gene expression in the cell types. Uh, do you look at the degree of gene expression? Are there certain lines of, of change that 
or evidence in a tumor, like, like who's characterized what heterogeneity means and looks like? Yeah, you have you can have two levels of heterogeneity. One is that the the tumor cells evolve over time, and you essentially have at the gene expression level, and we have that that the tumor cells are different. And the the other the second layer of heterogeneity is that you can have the tumor microenvironment that supports the tumor cells can be different in different regions. So, for instance, I mentioned about the immune cell, the immune system, the immune cells that can be different in different regions, but this can also um, happen with um, endothelial cells or cancer-associated fibroblasts. And we did that when you do single-cell RNA sequencing. You can quantify the contribution of tumor cells as opposed to the tumor like environment to the, let's say, genomic signal that you get in each of the samples that you analyze. So the contribution of this microenvironment of these known tumoral components to, for example, tumor evolution is, is, has been barely studied in, H in patocellular carcinoma or liver cancer. So certainly, uh, the, 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 the quantification of that heterogeneity in terms of cell lung mixtures or components and that ecosystem of different cells that form a given tumor will help and provide potentially new therapies. All right. So what have you seen is, uh, you know, how do the markers change as a tumor grows? Is it just more of one type of, uh, I mean, it, I would guess it'd be very complicated. I don't even know if there's any correlations or general statements you can make, but, you know, what's been observed? In terms of, sorry? Uh, in terms of what is given off by a tumor as it grows, you know, does it give off just more, you know, extracellular vesicles? Does it uh, give off very particular types of, uh, you know, metabolites or other signals as it grows, as it becomes more heterogeneous? Um, we haven't looked at that extensively. The what Generally, what you have is as, as a tumor grows or evolves, no, uh, because it may evolve without growing too much. But what you get is a, is a, is a clear different mutation profile. So you have a set of mutations that are common to all the tumor cells. Those are founder mutations that are shared by all the cells. And then a, a subclone of tumor cells acquire, it's a random effect, acquire a set of new mutations that are not present in other, let's say, tumor cells of the same nodule. So those uh, mutations that are gained or, or losses of potential tumor suppressor genes is what defines what can potentially provide specific growth advantages to the tumor cells. Now, in other, when you, you know, depart a little bit for just mutations, you look at gene expression or DNA methylation changes, and, and we, we're starting to look at that. So how that uh, DNA methylation heterogeneity can contribute to the emergence of aggressive clones within the tumor is still to be determined. But certainly it could contribute, and it's not only about mutations. The field has been very dominated by focusing on DNA mutations. But again, whether other layers of molecular information, call it gene expression or DNA methylation, or even the contribution of um, tumor microenvironment to, 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 to this process, is still uh, not very well established. If you think about, and one of the things that we found that is very striking, and, and we didn't follow up on that, but for time constraints, but one of the things very strange and interesting is that when you look at the different tumor regions of the same tumor nodule and, and looking at the single cell data, you find that in addition to the tumor cells being different, the, 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 the cells from the microenvironment may also be different. I'm talking about cancer-associated fibroblasts, for example. And there is emerging studies in, in, in other tumors that show that there are different types of cancer-associated fibroblasts. So despite these are not malignant cells per se, they're not transformed, they don't have mutations, they do not operate under normal conditions when they're in, in, embedded in the context of a, of a tumor. So that's very interesting because if you can somehow um, you know, target or affect some of these non-tumoral components, you may have also an anti-tumoral effect. But that's... Uh, have been very explored in, in in liver cancer. So I don't know what do you what do you think is going to be the first part of the progress? You, again, a lot of genetic mutations have been looked at. I mean, there was an article that came out recently in Science that talked about uh, bacteria living inside of tumor cells, not just around them. Hmm. Is is anyone in the uh, the liver arena looking at the microbiome of tumors, you know, in them and around them? Yeah, the, the, there are a number of studies. I think one of the first studies was done 
was published in 2012 by the group of Bob Schwabe from Colombia. And, and, and he showed that essentially when you decontaminate the gut of, of animals, of mice, uh, you're able to modify progression of, of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma of liver cancer. So there's many people working on trying to uh, you know, assess the contribution of the microbiome in not only liver cancer development, but also in, in, in liver cancer progression. And it, yeah, I saw that study. It's very interesting um, to have that within the tumors. In, in, in patients with liver cancer, remember that I told you that the majority of these patients have chronic liver disease, mostly cirrhosis. Well, in patients with cirrhosis, the barrier that, let's say, separates the gut from the liver is a little bit um, it's, 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 um, a little bit loose to some extent. So the, the, the possibility of some bacteria from the gut, you know, for being translocated to the liver is a little bit higher. So uh, people are trying to understand whether this translocation of bacteria somehow is primarily involved in the risk of developing tumors. But the data is still uh, derived from animal models, and, and, and we need, I guess, more data in humans to make sure that this, this could be a potential uh, way to prevent liver cancer development by targeting this uh, microbiome. Hmm. Interesting. So um, I don't know. Is there any uh, big signal that's coming from uh, you know from the liver and you know when it's in its disease state pre-cancer versus once you have a tumor or two and you know is that being looked at or is it just you know once the tumors come then okay now it's worth looking at. Well, there is this. Uh, before you have full-blown liver cancer, there is a previous precancerous lesion called these plastic nodules. They're they're very difficult to study in humans because they're very small, and, and generally you don't see them. What you, what you see them is when you do, for example, a liver transplant, you have the explant and, and of the cirrhotic liver, and you start doing you know extensive histological analysis. And within that analysis, you can start to see these small nodules. I'm talking about one centimeter smaller that are dysplastic foci. So there's a group of hepatocytes that are not, not normal, but they're not entirely malignant. It's, it's an intermediate phase. And there's there has been classical studies that show that in some of these dysplastic nodes, you can see early, very, very early um, hepatocellular calcium, very well differentiated tumors within these dysplastic nodules. So there's no question that these are polyneoplastic lesions. Now, uh, the, the attempt to characterize which are the, you know, the first very initial uh, alterations that make those dysplastic nodules turn into well-differentiated hepatocellular carcinomas, there, there are not that many studies. The only, I would say, clear gatekeeper lesion are mutations in the TERP promoter that can be found in up to 20 to 30 percent of dysplastic nodules. Now, we, uh, we're we trying to see if in our early detection studies, we can get some signals that are being derived from these plastic nodules, but it's not easy because as I mentioned, the, you know, to characterize these nodules in vivo in the patient is very difficult. Or it's almost impossible if you don't have histology. But certainly it's, it's, it would be fantastic to have a readout to identify the patients with these plastic nodules because certainly these patients are at higher risk of developing um, liver cancer. Yeah, makes sense. Mm. Um, so, I mean, what's, what, what do you see ahead for the next few years? Are there any uh, near-term breakthroughs that uh, you, know, you appear to be approaching? I think that to have a liquid biopsy-based, I mean, we're working with vesicles, but other people is working with DNA methylation in, in cell-free DNA. I think that would be a major game changer in the management of, of liver cancer. You have a, you know, easy liquid biopsy test for early detection. That's one. And the second thing is that... Uh, there's, so the, 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 the clinical benefit, the improvement in survival has been achieved at least in a subset of patients that are treated with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors is dramatic. So, uh, and, and that, what the consequence of that is that these therapies are now being tested heavily, not only in patients with advanced stage, but also patients with intermediate stages or early stages as adjuvant therapy after surgical resection. So we, it would be great to understand how or which are the patients that benefit from these therapies because not all of them benefit, but around 30%, 20%, 20, 30%, depending on the study of these patients, they do very well when they receive uh, immune-based therapies alone or in combination with thyroid kinase inhibitors. So 
I think that the two things that will, you know, will be game changers in the near future, talking about five years from now, will be that early detection tool based on liquid biopsy and, you know, the application of immune-based therapies to earlier stages so we can maximize the outcomes of patients uh, that are uh, currently receiving conventional therapies with resection and our transarterial chemoembolization. So that is, I think, will significantly improve outcomes in these patients. What's what's the normal prognosis for liver cancer? I know, I mean, the liver regenerates. I know it, it gets resected, I'm sure, plenty in, uh, that part of it does, at least, in liver cancer. But is liver cancer particularly fatal, or what are the stats on it? If you look overall, what I mean overall is that if you don't analyzed by tumor states, the prognosis is, is, is quite bad. So the median, so I would say that um, global data, the five-year survival of HCC as a whole is around 18%, which is um, the second most lethal, yeah, second most lethal tumor after pancreatic cancer. So it's a very lethal tumor. Now, when you look at, when you stratify based on states, the patients that have early stages, they do very well. So the five-year survival, when you have an early tumor that, are, that is resected with surgery, is uh, more than 70%, which is very good. That's why it's so important that we implement surveillance programs to have much more patients being diagnosed at early stages than at advanced stage. But still, it's a, it's a very deadly disease, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, very good. Augusto, what's the best way for people to learn more about your work and you know, keep tabs on liquid biopsies and the development of them? Uh, well, I guess we are uh, we're very active publishing papers on, on, on the type of studies that we do. And uh, there are a couple of reasons. Um, we have a web page on the lab. We have a couple of resources that are a couple of YouTube videos where we explain some of the results that we have. So we, we try to be quite open about our results and, and, and disseminate in different conferences. International Liver Cancer Association meeting that is happening virtual as a result of the pandemic in September. We're going to present three studies there. Um, so we, we try to be active in, in disseminating our results. Okay, well, very good. Well, Augusto, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having us. It's been a pleasure. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.